Interwebs, I'm Eric and welcome to The Looney Turtle. Last week I created a video that posed the idea that the kid in FNAF 4 was having a dream where he played hide and go seek with his robotic friends. Yeah, just throw that idea out the window, because over the past few days I've been trying to piece together the lore of these games. I think I have a pretty good picture, but you never know until people are able to challenge your theory, so let's get started. The first location, as far as you know, was Fredbear's Family Diner, as mentioned by Phone Guy in FNAF 2. Uh, we're gonna try to contact the original restaurant owner. Uh, I think the name of the place was Fredbear's Family Diner or something like that. As far as I know, there isn't a set date for the existence of this building, but I see it existing in the 60s sometime due to the next few things in my timeline. The diner stays open for a little while, but something causes the original owner to sell off the company to Fazbear Entertainment. Presumably, it was the kid getting killed in front of the original location. How do you know that this minigame took place at Fredbear's family diner? The same reasons as Game Theory stated in his video. It's a smaller location, there's only one animatronic, and the killer hasn't developed his signature yet, meaning that this is one of his first killings around Fredbear. Also, a popular theory is that this kid ends up becoming the puppet, but what if he ends up becoming Fredbear instead? But he's crying and then the puppet jump scare happens afterward. Yeah, but for me it would make a little bit more sense because Fredbear ends up talking to the kid in FNAF 4. Yeah, he's just an imaginary friend, isn't he? Well, it could be, or perhaps it's the first victim of Purple Guy. That way, when he says, I will fix you, rather than referring to the kid becoming him, he's meaning that he'll allow the child's spirit to live on in an animatronic that's a work in progress. Similar to Mangle at the time? Hmm? Plus, the kid's always crying in the FNAF 4 minigame, so rather than the puppet jump scare referring to who the first kid becomes, it's referring to who he creates. Anyways, something causes the original store owner to sell the Fredbear name to Fazbear Entertainment. In addition, animatronics are introduced to the Fredbear or Fazbear food chain in the 70s. If I were forced to sing those same stupid songs for 20 years... Since these were likely recorded before Mike Schmidt takes over, we can safely assume that the animatronics were introduced in the late 60s or the early 70s. After that, the next building in the timeline. Uh, welcome to your new career as a performer slash entertainer for Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. Right now we have two specially designed suits that double as both animatronic and suit. That sounds an awful lot like the location we saw in FNAF 4, doesn't it? There's two specialty animatronics that double as costumes. It also lines up pretty well with the tapes. The first and second tapes inform you of how to operate the springlock suits, while the third one discourages it. Uh, there's been a slight change of company policy concerning use of the suit. Um, don't. Similarly, in Night 3 of FNAF 4, you can see someone in an animatronic suit, while in an easter egg you can see Purple Guy in the background helping someone into what appears to be a regular, non-Springlock suit. The Fredbear suit isn't seen with someone inside of it from Night 3 onward, while the tapes discourage the use of them beginning with the third. This location likely didn't hear about the Springlock problems until later in the day, so Night 3 is like a transitional period. They get the new suits and start to discourage the use of the Springlock suits because they're unsafe. At the same time though, they need animatronics, so they're left on stage, or a pair of new animatronics are put on stage. I trust the former because Fredbear looks the same. During this time, there's a sister location as mentioned in the third tape. After learning of an unfortunate incident at the sister location involving multiple and simultaneous Springlock failures, the company has deemed the suit temporarily unfit for employees. I was looking up what a sister location is, but I only found articles that referred to a sister company. A sister company is when multiple companies are under the same parent company. Take for example the recent Epic Rap Battles of History. The Muppets, Marvel, and Maker Studio, the network that Epic Rap Battles is under, all have the same parent company. In this case, Disney. Maker Studio and Marvel are sister companies because they both have the same parent company. So, building from that, a sister location is when you have a franchise like 7-Eleven with multiple locations. They carry the same name, but are managed by different people. Due to this, I'm led to believe that when the phone guy said sister location, he's referring to another Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. In this alternate location, there could be more animatronics as seen in the TV commercial Easter Egg. That would also explain why the kid sees Foxy, Chica, Bonnie, and Freddy roaming around his home. They aren't based off of the plush toys, they're based off of this sister location's animatronics. And actually, let's get back to this kid for a moment because as many of you have let me know, he is in fact not the victim of the Bite of 87. But he's... let me explain. Firstly, let's go back to the first game and hear what the phone guy has to say about the Bite. Uh, they used to be allowed to walk around during the day too, but then there was the Bite of 87. Yeah. It's amazing that the human body can live without the frontal lobe. You know? 
So we know that the bite happened in 87, the person lost their frontal lobe, the animatronics were no longer allowed to roam after this point, meaning that the animatronic responsible was likely in free roaming mode, and most importantly, the victim lived. Firstly, there's that obligatory commercial Easter egg that is appropriately labeled Fred Bear and Friends 1983. Scott didn't put this detail in just to throw everyone off, he did it intentionally in order to tell us what year it is. The bite of 87 was also when the company stopped allowing the animatronics to roam freely. In FNAF 4, we can clearly see that the Fred Bear animatronic was sitting on stage and that the other kids forcefully shoved his head into its mouth. Thus, Fred Bear was immobile, ruling out the possibility of a roaming animatronic being the culprit in this instance. Then there's the fact that this kid's head was smashed, not his frontal lobe. Finally, is the nail in the coffin, like, Literally, the kid in FNAF 4 dies at the end of the game. In the last minigame, you can hear a heart monitor flatline as the kid fades into non-existence. We were playing as the kid. He was in a coma during the entire game and had nightmares that related to his brother's abuse, and he ended up dying sometime during, or a couple years after, 1983. After this, the Fredbear location is likely shut down, while the sister location is left to rot. That old restaurant was kind of left to rot for quite a while. I'll get back to that location in a minute though. For now, I want to move forward to the FNAF 2 location with the grand reopening. The Phone Guy's tapes were likely recorded in June of 1987, as what he describes sounds eerily similar to the newspaper clippings in FNAF 1. As a refresher, two children were reportedly lured to the back room on the night of June 26th. The bodies were never found, but the culprit was captured the following morning. If you look at a calendar from 1987, June 26th falls on a Friday, and what happens on the fifth night of FNAF 2? The day that would most likely fall on a Friday? Uh, from what I understand, the building was on lockdown, uh no one is allowed in or out, you know, especially concerning any previous employees. The building goes into lockdown? That seems a little suspicious. Then there's also the fact that the morning shift just became available. Hmm, seems like an employee was fired for some reason. Someone used one of the suits. We had a spare in the back, a yellow one. Someone used it. Parallels that I can draw between the newspaper clippings and this are just way too easy. Police think that the suspect dressed as a company mascot to earn the children's trust. I have no doubt that the newspaper clippings are playing out right before our eyes. The only problem though is that these clippings refer to a tragedy that happened many years ago. Perhaps it's referring to the kid in FNAF 4 or something else related to the sister location. So they close down for somewhere around 90 days after the animatronics are compared to reanimated corpses. Why 90 days? Well... Upon discovering that damage or death has occurred, a missing person report will be filed within 90 days or as soon as property and premises have been thoroughly cleaned and bleached and the carpets have been replaced. Blah blah blah. Now that might sound bad, I know. Might sound bad? MIGHT SOUND BAD! He basically just said that they'll clean up the evidence, bleach the surrounding areas, replace the carpets, and file a missing persons report after 90 days or as long as it takes to burn your body or whatever they plan to do with you. That's an extremely sketchy introductory greeting from the company, and it isn't in any way reassuring. Uh, getting back to my point though, we can see in the Save Them minigames that Freddy is wandering the FNAF 2 location where five dead bodies can be found strewn about the building. You're told to save them, but in the end you can't, mainly because they're already dead. After the puppet stuffs the bodies into the animatronic suits, the man is supposedly caught on surveillance. Soon afterwards, they close for a brief period where the company takes this time to clean up the animatronics. After this, they file a missing persons report for each of the children, explaining how five children are now linked to the incident at Freddy Fazbear's Pizza in the third newspaper clipping. After all this, they end up reopening in August for a few weeks before finally closing by year's end. Jeremy Fitzgerald gets his check in November, which is pretty close to year's end, and the newspaper under his check explains that they were only open for a few short weeks and that they might come back with a smaller budget at a smaller location. This now brings us to the sister location from earlier, otherwise known as the FNAF 1 location. How do we know this? Well, as I said before, this location existed while FNAF 4 took place. In 1983, in FNAF 1, we can see that this building is in a bit of disrepair. Damaged walls, cobwebs all over, and an overall creepy atmosphere is created, in turn showing us that this restaurant was left to rot for a few years. In addition, this location was likely shut down in the 80s due to the Foxy Run 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 minigame where he runs into a room of five more dead children. How do you know that this minigame takes place at the FNAF 1 location? 
Well, to be honest, there isn't a lot to go off of. We can clearly see that Foxy's running out of Pirate's Cove. The only location that we know of that has this feature is the FNAF 1 location, meaning that this is the most likely possibility. I've also been trying to see if these are the same dead children we see in the FNAF 2 location, but sadly I don't think they are. For one, the children in FNAF 2 were stuffed into the animatronic suits at the location where Foxy is in a state of disrepair, meaning that this minigame took place before or after the second location. I'm more keen to believe that it happened before this game because it would explain the tragedy that happened so many years ago, and resulted in the FNAF 1 location to be shut down for the first time. Then there's the Springtrap minigame that probably took place while this location was being neglected. Judging by how informally he acts, blah, blah, blah. this is late in his career at Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. He's been involved with the company's wrongdoing for a long while, but he hasn't gotten a full picture until his final week when he decides to look into the heads in the back room. Yeah, I, I always wondered what was in all those empty heads back there. He sounds unsettled by what he finds. I would think that the killer would be surprised, not uncomfortable by finding his victims. In addition, he sounds concerned about your safety in the second game when he tells you that someone used one of the suits. Someone used one of the suits. We had a spare in the back, a yellow one. Someone used it. It seems like he didn't expect any of this to happen, while the killer would have known exactly what's been happening around these locations. Other than that, I have a few minor theories, but since this video is already longer than most of my other videos, I'll leave it at that for now. If you enjoyed this video and want to see more, then consider becoming a Patreon today. You can also feel free to subscribe, like, favorite, and all that stuff, and as always, let me know what you guys think in the comments below, and I'll see you next time.